We've affirmed provision in old age, access to 12 years of education, basic nutrition to be rights in this country. The reason is very simple. Those things are fundamental to human flourishing and vitality. Show me an argument that says that housing isn't fundamental to human flourishing and vitality. Of course it is. Housing should be a right in this country. And the reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. Welcome and thank you for attending this wonderful event hosted by the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. The oli that I just performed was composed by the Kumuhula Edith Kanaka Ole for her hula halo. Today, this oli is used to focus the energies of these events and ensure that we carry out the kuleana responsibilities that we've undertaken. And now I'd like to introduce the Dean of the College of Social Sciences, Denise Conan. Mahalo. Aloha and mahalo. Mahalo Makini. Thank you so much for that inspiring chant. Um, Makini is one of our uh, upcoming graduates of the Department of Psychology, and we're so um, honored that, uh, and I'm honored that all of you are joining us this evening. I look around and it's so amazing to see that we're coming back in person for times like these. Um, this is the second time we've been back in person for this event, the, uh, the Better Tomorrow series. And, and today we see, uh, looking around, the number of people that came out today are in the several hundred. And I know online there are many, many more of you that are watching this evening. And it is because of the significance of today's subject area where we are tackling some of the most difficult issues that Hawaii faces, bringing in thought leadership around these topics of affordable housing. And, um, you know, I think that you realize, because each of us and many of us are struggling today to find ways to afford housing here in our islands. And it can be a, a, a very difficult struggle indeed for, for many of, a, of us. And, you know, we, some of us are pushed to the, the brink in this um, challenge and we need new solutions. We need to discover ways to find um, protections for those that are renting in Hawaii to find um, new ways to afford the cost of being here and to preserve the structure of our families here in Hawaii. So it's very important to have these outside perspectives that we can bring to the conversation around this. Um, and I think that's why, as I look around, that we see so many people that have come out today to consider this topic and to get insights on this topic. Thank you so much for taking your time today to come out for a topic like this. Mahalo. 
Okay, and I want to also thank the organizers of the Better Tomorrow series, uh, Robert Perkinson and all of the people that are supporting his efforts, his students, many of you have met them coming in, and um, those that are making this event possible. Um, this is really a joint venture between University of Hawaii and the Hawaii Community Foundation and the Kamehameha Schools and other donors who are really focused on trying to elevate the level of conversations that we're having about consequential topics. Um, this series is also supported by my college. If I didn't introduce myself properly, I am uh, Denise Conan, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences, and I'm so happy to see many of you here from my college today. Um, but also the um, ACLU of Hawaii, the um, Richardson School of Law, the Sociology Department, the Matsunaga Institute of Peace, the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, the Scholar Strategy Network. There are many people that are supporting the, this subject area coming to the forefront today. And so uh, for all of those of you that have contributed to today's events, I really do thank you very, very much. Um, I want to also point out that this evening is also an engagement and your input is very important. So we are listening to your questions and part of today's um, function will include um, questions from you. So if you came in, there were no cards distributed to you. If you want no cards, please raise your hand. And um, we do want to hear your questions and that will become a part of today's um, topic, the introducing uh, your question. So please do participate in that. Um, it's now really my pleasure to introduce um, a, a good friend of mine, um, Senator Stanley Chang, who has been a champion and leader in this area of affordable housing on behalf of our state of Hawaii, uh, looking for new solutions, looking for models, not just locally, but globally, to address issues of affordable housing. Um, and so I'd like to welcome him forward to also introduce our speaker today, um, Senator Stanley, Stanley Chang from um, District 9. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Mahalo, thank you very much. Good evening and aloha. aloha. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Denise. Um, it's great to be here tonight in person. I haven't been to one of these things in like two years. And it's also great to see some of my colleagues in the state legislature, true real champions of housing. I see House Housing Chair Nadine Nakamura and Vice Chair Troy Hashimoto. Um, <laughs> And I think Senator San Buenaventura, Joy San Buenaventura is in the back, the Human Services Chair. And of course, we have Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, who uh, is in the front row here. So I have the honor tonight of introducing one of the most influential voices on housing issues in the whole country, Professor, Professor Matthew Desmond. He's the Maurice P. During Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. After receiving his PhD in 2010 from the University of Wisconsin, he joined the Harvard Society of Fellows as a junior fellow in my old dorm of Elliott House, where he was eating gourmet meals and drinking fine sherry while we were eating cafeteria food next door. <laughs> he went on to receive the MacArthur Genius Fellowship, among other honors and he launched the Eviction Lab to collect national data on eviction and help answer fundamental questions about residential instability, forced moves, and poverty in America. In 2018, the Eviction Lab published the first ever national data set of evictions in America, collecting millions of data points going back to 2000. 
He's the author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller and 2017 Pulitzer Prize winner, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. That's this book. Um, but I'll tell you, the strongest endorsement that I've heard is from Professor Colin Moore, who I think is also in the audience. He said this is one of the few books that he assigns to his students that they actually read. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to reading this. Um, his work is particularly relevant here in Hawaii, where we have one of the nation's lowest rates of home ownership and highest rates of rentership. Due to the pandemic, we've just been through the worst economic crisis in generations, in which we had the highest unemployment rate in the country. Yet house prices have gone up relentlessly, now topping $1.1 million in three of the four counties of Hawaii. In 1983, my father was able to buy a house with one state salary as a UH professor. For me to buy that same house today would take over 40 years of my entire salary as a state employee. The rent is just too damn high. That is why Hawaii has now entered five straight years of population decline. And frankly, that should come as no surprise because we literally built 10 times as much housing 50 years ago as we do today. But beyond the statistics and the facts and figures, Professor Desmond's most impactful work is unveiling the human cost of each eviction, how deeply families and children are scarred due to this routine business transaction. Professor Desmond, we are eager to hear from you tonight. I hope your lecture tonight before this audience of important stakeholders and decision makers is the start of a new era here in Hawaii in which we finally sit up and take major action to end our housing shortage and to prevent the tragic evictions that are the inevitable consequence. Now, everyone, please join me in giving Professor Matthew Desmond our warmest Hawaii welcome. What's up? Uh, thank you, Stan, for that amazing welcome. Um, thank you for your vision and your work on housing. Uh, no thanks for reminding me about the depressing, existentially confusing time I spent in the Harvard Society Fellows. Um, and uh, thank you so much for this warm welcome. It's really an honor to be here. It's great to be with you. It's great to be anywhere. Um, I've been in Hawaii with my family for the past 10 days. It's been a really wonderful for us to experience your hospitality and food and land and culture. So thank you so much for this invitation. America is the richest country with the worst poverty in the world. It's who we are. There's no other advanced industrial society that has the kind of poverty that we have, the levels of poverty that we have. And that's always really bugged me. <clears throat> and I know it bugs a lot of you. And so I thought that understanding housing was a decent way of understanding what America is like, understanding the inequality problem. And I wanted to understand it through eviction specifically, this physical removal of people from their homes. So I went about this work the old fashioned way. I moved into a mobile home park on the south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is a city in America. It's in the middle of the country, it's our fourth, 14th, 40th biggest city. And I moved into a mobile home park in Milwaukee, and I lived there for about five months. And then I moved into a rooming house on the north side of Milwaukee, which is Milwaukee's inner city. And I lived there for about 10 months. And from those two areas, I followed families getting evicted. I went everywhere with those families. I went to eviction court with them. I helped them move. I followed them into shelters, into abandoned homes. I ate from their table. I slept on their floor. I watched their kids. Went to a bunch of funerals with them. Was there for a birth, like there for a birth. Dean, you ever been to a birth? <laughs> it's intense. But I knew that if I was gonna understand like how the housing market worked, I needed to get landlord's perspectives too. So if you were getting evicted, I wanted to get just as close to your landlord doing the evicting as I did with you. 
So I did. So I passed out eviction notices with landlords, and I helped fix up their properties, and I learned a bit more about what makes them tick and what ticks them off. I know why you would be a landlord of a mobile home park in a very poor city in America, and I tried to write a book about this incredibly complicated, fraught relationship, but one that's essential if we want to understand our cities today, which is the relationship between landlords and tenants. So I was going about this work, and there are all these questions that kept springing to mind, just, just like basic stuff, like, how often does eviction happen? Who gets evicted? What are the long-term consequences of getting tossed out of your home? And I went looking for some data that would allow me to answer these questions. It just came up empty, which is crazy. And so I decided to do a few things to collect you know, statistical data on the problem. So one thing that we did is we designed a survey, and we talked to over 1,000 renters all over Milwaukee, and we asked them questions about their kids and their experiences with homelessness and eviction and housing problems. We sent interviewers to some of the most affluent neighborhoods of the city, which are these blue dots, and some of the most poorest neighborhoods in the city, which are those red dots. Uh, I had an interviewer mugged. Uh, one was bit by a dog. It's actually the same guy, same interviewer, actually. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Steve. Steve needs to work on his situational awareness. But we worked, we worked hard for these data, you know? And the things that I was learning on the ground, living with, with folks getting evicted, working alongside landlords, doing the evicting, were informing these larger statistical efforts, like not only the questions we asked, but how we even asked the question. So take, how do you ask someone if they've been evicted? So when I was in the mobile home park, Tim uh, was my neighbor, and he was working construction, hurt his back, got hurt on the job, lost his job, couldn't make the rent, got evicted. He and his wife's names appear in the evic eviction records in court. So I asked his wife, Rose, like, well, what was it like being evicted? And she was like, we were not evicted. Eviction is like when the sheriff comes and they throw your stuff out, the landlord changes the lock, that's an eviction, we weren't evicted. So if we were like every other game in town, and we were like, you know, have you been evicted? Like in our survey, a lot of folks like Rose and Tim would have said no, and I think it speaks to the value of community engagement before we kind of run on and try to study these things like academics. Didn't stop there, collected hundreds of thousands and now hundreds of millions of eviction records from all over the country. Uh, we did a, did a survey in eviction court because we were like confused by why you get evicted but you don't even though you owe the landlord the same amount of money. Collected 911 calls, hundreds of nuisance ordinances, whatever I could get my hands on and try to put that big data into a conversation with the smaller data. You know, my notebooks, the things I was learning on the ground every day in Milwaukee. And in that spirit, Evicted, this book I wrote, is really a book that starts on the ground and it, it ends on the ground. It follows eight families through the process of eviction. So some are white, some are black, some have kids, some don't. So like Lorraine's in the book. Lorraine was my neighbor in the mobile home park. She was a grandma, spending over 70% of her income to rent a mobile home in a trailer park that was literally condemned by the city for being an environmental biohazard. Um, Vanetta's in the book. Vanetta was this like amazing mom trying to raise three young kids. And uh, she would work at an old country buffet during the recession, and her hours got cut. And she was so terrified of losing her home and maybe her kids to child protective services that she committed armed robbery to, to make rent with someone without a criminal record. I was giving this talk like a few years ago in South Carolina, and I told that story. And this guy comes up to me after a really trouble, and he was like, I was the CEO of Old Country Buffet when that happened. And I was like, I have Vanetta's phone number. And we had a little God moment. He made, it, he made things right. So in that spirit, in the spirit of like letting folks that have experienced this problem kind of guide our conversation tonight, I wanted to share with you a one person story tonight. Uh, and that's Arlene's story. So Arlene had a 14-year-old son named Jory. Uh, and he was cutting up one day, throwing snowballs at passing cars. Uh, snow is a cold white substance that falls from the sky. And Jory packed this snowball and smacked this car. And this man jumped out, like pissed off. And so Jory and his cousin hightailed it inside. They locked the door. But then the man followed them there and kicked the door in, like busted the door down. And thank God he left before anything else happened. But when Arlene's landlord found out about that, she decided to evict Jory and the boys for damaging property. So Arlene took her two kids, Jory and Jafaris. Jafaris was six, to the Salvation Army Homeless Shelter, which everyone in Milwaukee just calls the lodge. So you can tell your kids, like, we're staying at the lodge tonight, like it's a motel. And from there, they were on the hunt for another place to live. And they found this place, which was on 19th Street. Uh, but there was only no water, and Jory had a bucket out was in the toilet. But Arlene told me, look, it was $525 for a whole house, and it was quiet. It was my favorite place. 
When we looked at that data we collected, that survey data we collected, and we asked what happens to families after they get evicted, one thing that we found is they move into much worse housing than they lived in before. So if we want to know why some kids live with like lead paint, exposed wires, no heat, no water, one reason is their families are forced to accept those conditions in the harried aftermath of an eviction. So the city eventually found this place unfit for human habitation, and they boarded up the windows and the doors, and Arlene and the boys were on the hunt for another place to live. And she told Jory, we take whatever we could get, which is what moving looks like in that kind of situation. You just take whatever you could get. And what Arlene could get was this drab apartment complex on Atkinson Avenue. But she soon learned that the whole apartment complex was really drug-soaked and hot. The whole block was really crime-filled, and she feared for her boys, like any mother would, especially for Jory, who was, like, goofy and had this beautiful smile and would just talk to anybody. So in Arlene's case, why she moved, the fact that she was kicked out of this place, was pretty important for understanding why she ended up in such a bad neighborhood. And we thought, can we test that statistically? And we did. And we found that you can control for a lot of different things, and you still see that families who get evicted move from poor neighborhoods to even poorer ones. They move from high crime neighborhoods to even more dangerous places in the city. Eviction seems to push families deeper into disadvantage. So Arlene moved out of that place as fast as she could. She found this two-bedroom bottom unit duplex on crossroads called 13th Street and Keefe, right in the middle of the inner city of Milwaukee. There's a big old hole in the living room window. Uh, the carpet was just like filthy and ground in. The door didn't have a lock on it, so Arlene learned to lock it with a plank. She slid into brackets. But she put it on a good face. You know, she stuffed a piece of cloth in the window and she uh, hung up ivory curtains. So the rent for this kind of place, which was located in a very poor neighborhood in America's fourth poorest city, was $550, utilities not included, which consumed 88% of Arlene's welfare check. And she knew that some months she would have to sell her food stamps to make rent, and her and the boys would get by on oodles and noodles. When you're paying over 80% of your income on rent, there's no extra money for, like, anything. Like, books for Jory or toys for Jafar. So Jafar said this brilliant ability to transform like a bucket or mop, whatever he could get his hands on, into soldiers and tanks engaged in, in warfare. So as you all know, Arlene is not alone in spending the vast majority of her income on housing costs. For about 100 years, there's been this idea in America, Senator Chang mentioned it earlier, that we should spend 30% of our income on housing. And for a long time, a lot of Americans hit that goal, met that goal. And that goal allows you to afford enough food, afford transportation, invest in your kids. But for so many renting Americans today, that goal is a pipe dream. So this is a graph that comes from the census. It shows the percentage of poor renting Americans spending 30% or less of their income on housing costs, which is this blue line, or 50% or more of their income on housing costs, orange line. And you'll see the percentage of poor renting Americans hitting our own standard of affordability has been dropping quick over the last two decades. But the percent that are spending at least half of what they have on their housing has just gone up and up and up to the point that today, the majority of poor renting families are spending at least half of their income on housing costs. And about one in four of those families are spending over 70% of their income just on rent and utilities. 70% of your income is just gone at the beginning of the month if you want a roof over your head and hot water. Under those conditions, you don't need to make a huge mistake or have a big emergency hit your life to get evicted. Uh, something as small as a snowball can do it. So for families like Arlene's, eviction is much more the result of inevitability than irresponsibility. Now look, when I first crunched these numbers, I thought they were wrong and unbelievable. Let me tell you who these numbers leave out. They leave out everyone in the census reporting they're spending over all of their income on housing costs. Now some of those people, it's a mistake, it's a, it's a data error. But some of that is life. Arlene is spending 88% of our income on rent. Forget about utilities. So how is that even possible? What you do is you pay your landlord in the winter in cold areas like Milwaukee when there's a moratorium on gas shutoffs. But when that moratorium lifts in the spring and April, you switch teams and you start paying your debt to the utility company 
because you got to be back in the black next winter to benefit from the moratorium. That's why evictions spike in the summer and drop in the winter. These numbers are hard to believe, and they're too low. So how do we get here? So for the past two decades, really for the past four, uh, incomes for many Americans have been very flat. So if you're living in a home headed by someone with a high school education or less, which are those two bottom lines, your income really hasn't moved in the last 20 years. In some areas of the country, it's fallen in real terms, including this area of the country. But as that was happening, housing costs were soaring. They were soaring all over the country in hot markets like Honolulu and LA and San Francisco and New York, but also in like the South, the Midwest, Houston, Texas, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Basically, rents have doubled over the last 20 years where incomes have been flat. So families have this shrinking gap between what they're bringing in and what they have to pay for just a basic roof over their head. And then we might ask, all right, well, what, what, what about the government? What about public housing? What about, I've heard about these things called Section 8 vouchers. What about those? And the answer is they, they're there, they exist, they help, but they're only for the lucky minority of families today. So only about one in four families who qualifies for any kind of housing assistance, any kind, public housing, a housing voucher, receives it. But the unlucky majority, the remaining 75%, receive uh, nothing, not a Zippo from state, local, or federal governments, which would be a pretty crazy thing to stomach when it comes to other basic needs. Imagine if we turned away three and four families who applied for food stamps. Like, I'm sorry, ma'am, uh, we, we see you qualify, we just don't have enough for you. But that's exactly how we treat low-income families searching for affordable shelter today. Arlene gave up that search like a long time ago, but one day, just like on a whim, she stopped by the housing authority and she asked about the list. And she was told by the person behind the glass, like, the list is frozen. Because on it were 3,500 families who had applied for rent assistance five years ago. Which is pretty good, actually, I gotta say. Pretty good for an American city. Like, the waiting list for public housing in some of our biggest cities is no longer counted in years, it's counted in decades. So if I applied for public housing today in Washington, D.C., for example, I have two young kids. Chances are I'd be a grandfather by the time my application came up for review. So if Arlene wanted public housing, this is what she'd have to do. She'd have to wait three or four years till the list unfroze, till she just get to put, got to put her name on the list. Then she'd have to wait like another five or six years till her name made it to the top of the pile. And then she'd just have to like pray that the person reviewing her application would ignore all the evictions she's collected while trying to make ends meet unassisted in the private market. So when we think of like the typical poor family today, we shouldn't picture them living in public housing or getting any kind of help from the government. We should picture someone like Arlene because she's our typical case. So on 13th Street, Arlene got like a bucket of paint and brushes and she gave the walls a fresh coat. But not long after moving in, her sister died and she pitched in for the funeral. It wasn't her biological sister, it was like a really close friend. We have people like this in our life, and she gave out a love. Uh, she didn't have the money, but like no one else did either. The next month, she missed an appointment with her welfare caseworker because the letter announcing her appointment was mailed to 19th Street, or maybe Atkinson Avenue. And so the caseworker typed something into the computer, and Arlene's $628 a month check was cut. We call it getting sanctioned and she fell two months behind in rent, and she got the pink papers. Milwaukee is a city of about 104,000 renter homes. Every year in Milwaukee, landlords evict 16,000 people. That's 40 people a day evicted in Milwaukee, or one in 14 people evicted in the inner city every year alone, which is insane. It's an insane amount of instability. That means you walk down uh, the street, uh, any street in the inner city of Milwaukee, and you look to your left, and you look to your right, and on either side of you, at least one apartment is gone by the end of the year. But how representative is Milwaukee? Like, how big of a problem is this? I published this book a few years ago, and I'd go to, I'd go to Nebraska, and I'd go to Kansas, and people would be like, how big of a problem is eviction in my, my city? We had no idea. The federal government doesn't collect eviction on eviction data which is like not knowing how many kids drop out of high school every year or how many Americans get cancer every year. This is a major social problem we didn't know anything about. 
So for the past few years, I've had a privilege of being on a team, we call ourselves the Eviction Lab, and we've built the only national eviction data set. And we've collected over 100 million eviction records. We have done things for you like pull eviction records out of a gas station in West Texas and get chased out of a eviction court in Kentucky. We worked really hard to really complete these data and we've made them all public. And you don't have to have two PhDs in computer science to navigate these data. You can go online and you can look at data for uh, almost everywhere in the country. We're gonna have a new data dump coming very soon, which will mean we'll have updated and good comprehensive Hawaiian data, which I don't think we have now. But watch our site. One of the things we've been doing too is like tracking eviction during the pandemic. The intervention that the federal government made in the eviction crisis during the pandemic was historic. And like the government bureaucrats that designed the rescue plan deserve a parade. Look at this. So we had an eviction moratorium go into effect uh, right uh, when the Trump administration transitioned to the Biden administration. It was the only moratorium the country's ever had on evictions, and it lasted about a year. It dropped the COVID death rate, one estimate, by 11% which means we saved tens of thousands of lives just keeping people in their home. Then the federal government devoted $46 billion to, keeping, to paying people's debt, which is like taking HUD's budget, doubling it, and throwing it all at those families. And evictions now nationwide are still below national average. This is amazing to me. After the Great Recession, it took poor families 12 years to recover their incomes. After this recession, it took 20 months. I think this, this administration isn't giving enough, getting enough props, and I'm just here to give it a little props. So if you want updated uh, eviction data for as many cities as we can get it, you can go on our website, you can contact us, you can call us, you can email us, anything you want. We're here to kind of answer all your eviction questions. Now, these numbers reflect only formal court-ordered evictions, okay? These are evictions that are processed at the court. But there are other ways, oh, let me show you this. This is something that I think we forget when we live in a city like Honolulu. Where does eviction happen? Like, whose problem is it? Is it just a problem of like really expensive cities? And the answer is no. Like the highest evicting cities in the country are pretty average cost cities, like Richmond, Virginia, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wilmington, Delaware. Who's talking about Wilmington, Delaware when it comes to the housing crisis? We should be. The crisis isn't just reflected in sky high rents and sky high proper, uh, property cost. It's also reflected in these eviction statistics. This also isn't just an urban phenomenon. So here the purple is, uh, so these lines are county lines. The purple is the density of the population. So deeper purple means urban area. So yes, we have big eviction rates in places like uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, or, or Pittsburgh. But we also have non-trivial eviction rates in rural communities, county, suburban communities. So when we're talking about the eviction crisis, we're not just talking about a coastal issue or an expensive city issue. We are really talking about American issue. So this is Joe Porzynski. He was a building manager in the inner city of Milwaukee. And he's like, Matt, for every eviction that I do that goes to the court, there are like 10 that don't. So what Joe would do, he would be like, look, you're behind, and I need to pay my mortgage. I'll tell you what, if you're out by Sunday, I'll give you 200 bucks, and you can use my van to move. If you got to get evicted, that's a pretty nice eviction. I met another landlord that if he's, if he's mad at you, he'll just take your front door off. He'll remove your front door. I met another landlord that will short circuit the electricity on his own apartment, and then he places a call to the city anonymously on himself, which causes building inspectors to remove a family living in a place for unfit for, that's unfit for human habitation. So there are a lot of ways to get a family out that don't go through the inside of a courtroom, and we worked really hard to try to count all those ways, all those informal evictions. And if you add those up to formal evictions that are legally processed, and if you count things like building condemnations, like what happened to Arlene's place on 19th Street, you learn that like in Milwaukee, every two years, one in eight renters is evicted. Not one in eight like people in super deep poverty, like just one in eight renters. And for a long time, poverty researchers, journalists, we've written sentences like this. <clears throat> Low income families exhibit high rates of residential instability, period. Which is a bad sentence. But what we're learning is that poor families are moving so much because they're forced to. This isn't just a rhetorical point. You can run statistical models that show that poor families don't move more than anyone else if you control for evictions. Which means if we want more family stability and more community stability, we need fewer evictions. 
This is a problem that affects the young and the old, the sick and the able body, but the face of our eviction epidemic is just moms with kids, moms with kids. For any of y'all who've ever been to eviction court, you just know, you go inside, there's just a ton of kids running around. Until recently, the housing court in the South Bronx in New York City literally had a daycare inside of it because there were so many kids coming through its doors. South Bronx eviction court daycare. And black women like Arlene, and mothers in particular, are evicted at stunningly high rates. Among Milwaukee renters, one in five black women reports being evicted sometime in her life, compared to one in 15 white women. I think that statistic should trouble us. I think that should disturb us, because that means that eviction is something like the feminine equivalent to incarceration. We know that many low-income African-American men are being swept up by the long arm of the criminal justice system in America, they're being locked, locked up. But many poor African-American women are being locked out. They are disproportionately bearing the brunt of this crisis. This also isn't just a crisis that's affecting places like the north side of Milwaukee. It's affecting poor white communities, which I write about a lot of the books, it's affecting immigrant communities. It's everywhere in the country. Arlene went to eviction court. And as is court custom in Milwaukee, she got to stay two extra days in her home for each of her two kids. And those days came and went, and she was ordered to be out on a day in early January. Milwaukee's cold in early January. And this was like a devastatingly cold winter. When this happened, the weatherman said it could drop below 40 with the wind chill. But if Arlene waited any longer, like the sheriff would come. And they would arrive with a team of movers and a judge's order and a sidearm. And they pile everything on the sidewalk, like everything, like the meat cuts in the freezer, the shower curtain, Jafar's asthma machine. So Arlene struck out into the cold, and she and Jory loaded a U-Haul moving truck that a friend of the family had rented for them. And I just got to tell you all, it was freezing. It was like that kind of cold that burns you. Took her stuff to a storage unit. Arlene finally found a domestic violence shelter. Uh, had a room about 40 minutes away from Milwaukee. She just lied about being abused so she could get her kids a room. And she was once again on the hunt for another place to live. And so she called on 20 apartments, and then 40, and then 60, and then 80. I, I counted. She had been evicted. She would, excuse me, she had been accepted to none of them. And even in the inner city, Many of her out of reach, and the places she could afford if she basically threw everything she had at the rent weren't calling back either. And part of the problem, besides her poverty, was her eviction record. So this is what eviction record looks like. It's public. It's published online for anyone to see. It shows the date of your eviction, how much you know a landlord is claiming you owe them, and if you got evicted or not. And from a landlord's point of view, this is a big deal. This is a marker of risk. This is a bad tenant. Most landlords that I met with didn't accept anyone that got evicted within the last two or three years. This is the reason why a lot of families are moving into worse neighborhoods and a worse, po you know, worse neighborhoods and worse housing uh, than they lived in before because they're, they're blemished, they're marked. There was another reason a lot of landlords are saying no. One wanted $800 a month plus like an additional $75 for jewelry. And Arlene allowed herself to laugh at him. Another landlord on the phone just said, like, we don't want your kids, ma'am. Children cooped up in apartments, you know, they use, like, the curtains for superhero caves. They flush toys on the toilet. Cause some dude whose car just been smacked with a snowball to kick your door down. They can test powder for lead. That could bring a pricey abatement order. They can draw the attention of child protective services, the police. One landlord that I met was like, look, kids cause us headache. Discriminating against children is illegal, but many of us don't even count it as discrimination. Audit studies show that families face discrimination in one out of two of their housing searches. Arlene didn't have time to think about that. She just dialed another number. So finally, the 90th landlord she spoke to, Mr. 90, said yes. He had a one-bedroom apartment. It was $525 a month. Arlene didn't care what the apartment looked like, what the neighborhood was like. She told Jory, a house is a house. So two months after they, moved, they got evicted, uh, they moved in. And once she and the boys had loaded a lot of stuff, Arlene just like sat down on the floor. And um, Jafaris came and like snuggled up into her lap. And Jory came over and kind of pitched his head into his mom's shoulder. And they just, you know, like stayed like that for a long time. 
So Arlene got her stuff out of storage. Uh, she hung pictures on the wall. She liked to keep things neat, so she hung a sign over the sink that said, Jory, if you don't clean up after yourself, we're going to have problems. Do you guys remember what it's like to be 14 years old? It sucked, right? It sucks. So for, Jory's 14. He's experiencing these stretches of homelessness. Between seventh grade and eighth grade, Jory goes to five different schools. Starts going to a new school. Then he starts acting out a bit. And one day, a teacher yells at him. And he gets angry. And he kicks her, kicks her in the leg, and runs home. So the teacher called the principal, but then she thought it was appropriate to call the police. And when the police visited Arlene and Jory at their new place, the landlord saw that visit. He told her she had to go. It's kids. Kids are a big part of the story. When I started this book, I thought that kids would shield families for ev from eviction. It's the opposite. In fact, when we looked in that data that we did in Eviction Core, when we were trying to figure out what makes the difference between this person who gets evicted and this person that doesn't, you know what, what it was? It wasn't race. It wasn't your gender. It wasn't even how much you owed your landlord. It was kids. The chance of you getting an eviction judgment in court triple all else equal if you live with kids. And what you're seeing in that finding is landlord discretion. You're seeing a lot of landlords say, I'll work with you, but not with you. So after that um, eviction, Arlene started to unravel a little bit. She told me, it's like I got a curse on me. It won't stop for nothing. Sometimes I find my body trembling or shaking. I'm tired, but I can't sleep. I'm fixing to have a nervous breakdown. My body's trying to shut down. I published a study a few years ago that showed that moms who get evicted experience higher rates of depression two years later. It stays with you. And we know that between 2005 and 2010, years where housing costs were soaring around the country, there was one other indicator that was going up too, which were uh, suicides attributed to eviction. They doubled during that five-year time span. Arlene told me, just my soul is messed up. I wish my life was different. I wish that when I'm an old lady, I can sit back and look at my kids, and they'll be grown. And they'll become something, something more than me. And we'll all be together and be laughing. We'll be remembering stuff like this and be laughing at it. The home, it's the center of life. It's our um, refuge from, from work, the pressures of school, the, the threats of the street. We say that at home we're ourselves, everywhere else we remove our masks. In languages spoken all over the world, the word for home encompasses not just shelter, but warmth, family, community, the womb. In ancient Egypt, the hieroglyph for home is the same one for mother. So eviction causes loss. Families lose their home, obviously. Kids lose their school, lose your neighborhood ties. You have to lose all your stuff, which are piled on the street and scavenged by neighbors or taken to storage by movers. And it takes a good amount of time and money to build a home. An eviction can just delete all that. An eviction comes with a mark or a blemish, which can prevent you from moving into good housing and safe neighborhood. But it can also prevent you from moving into public housing. Because the folks that run our public housing authorities, even though they don't have to, count eviction as a mark against your application. 
which means we're systematically denying housing help to the families that need it the most. So we push those families into slum housing, and we push those families into our worst neighborhoods. I have a study that shows that eviction causes job loss, and if any of y'all in this room have been evicted, you know why. It's such a consuming, stressful event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market, and then there's the effect that eviction has on your soul, your mental health. And I think when we add all that up, we have to conclude that evictions, which used to be rare in America, which used to draw crowds, they're not just a condition of poverty. Evictions are also a cause of poverty. They are making things worse, and they're leaving a diva jagged scar on the next generation. We can't fix poverty in America or in Hawaii without addressing the housing crisis. So how, how do we address it? So imagine if every family in this state, in this country, had a decent, affordable place to live. If Arlene didn't have to give 80% of her income on rent, she could keep her kids fed and clothed and off the streets. We know from previous research that when families finally receive a housing voucher, after years and years on the waiting list, when they finally receive this ticket that allows them to pay only 30% of their income on rent instead of 60 or 70% of it, they do one consistent thing with their freed up money. They take it to the grocery store. They buy more food. Their kids become stronger and less anemic. They move to better neighborhoods. They don't move as much. They work for the lucky minority of families today. But the vast majority of poor families in America aren't so lucky, and their kids, with names like Jory and Jafaris, aren't getting enough to eat because the rent eats first. And if like we can't afford the freedoms this country offers us without a roof over our head, I don't need to get fancy about these freedoms. Basic stuff. The freedom to invest in ourselves, to be part of a community, to protect our kids. Then shouldn't access to a basic, affordable home be part of what it means to be an American? We've affirmed provision in old age, access to 12 years of education, basic nutrition to be rights in this country. The reason is very simple. Those things are fundamental to human flourishing and vitality. Show me an argument that says that housing isn't fundamental to human flourishing and vitality. Of course it is. Housing should be a right in this country. And the reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So if we can buy into that, then the question is like, OK, how can we deliver on that obligation? And I got to say, there's just like a lot of good news here, actually. There's a lot of good news. I mean, like just a few generations ago, there were slums in our cities. There were outhouses in the middle of Philadelphia when some of us were still alive. Babies were dying of tuberculosis. Poor folks not only didn't have water, they didn't have windows, they didn't have heat. You had to wear your winter coat inside all winter long. We took on a battle with the slum as a country, and we won. We won that battle. And I'll be the first to admit we still have a long way to go. Like when I was in the mobile home park in Milwaukee, I, told, I didn't have hot water. And I told the landlord, like, um, I'm a rider. I'm going to ride about you in your trailer park. So can I <laughs> hot water my trailer? So I get, like, I get it. But there's no denying that the country hasn't made huge leaps forward into the quality kind of, of housing that folks are living in today. I just think this is a really basic idea that we should meditate on. Because a lot of times when we gather in spaces like this, we talk about poverty and homelessness, and racism. Those problems can feel so eternal and huge and unfixable. But it's not true. Like when we as a country have wanted to take on huge problems, we have come up with big solutions. I also take a lot of heart in the fact that there are organizations and people all around the country just putting in work, driving down family homelessness, preserving our rental housing, fighting evictions. And so one thing that my family and I have done with proceeds from this book is started an organization called JustShelter.org. And so you can go to this website. It's called JustShelter.org. And you can click on Hawaii. And you can just look and see what organizations are put in the work in my community. You can get plugged in, maybe with your time or money. Or you can just learn what the problem looks like in, in your own communities. I think there are so many people working so hard in these issues in the trenches, invisible for so long. And this is a way to raise their invisibility just a little bit. OK, so what's the, what's the bigger picture here? You know, a problem as big as the affordable housing crisis, it calls for a big solution. We're bleeding out. 
and it would be disingenuous of me to stand up before you and say some little nudge will fix it or some little Band-Aid will we'll stop the bleeding. It, it won't. We need real moral leadership on this issue. We need bold policy vision on this issue. Here's one idea. We take a program that we have that works pretty darn well, which is the Affordable Housing Choice Voucher Program, and we expand it to everyone who needs it. The idea is really simple. If you qualified for the program, hear me out, you'd, you'd benefit from the program. Hear me out. And you would get a ticket, and you can live anywhere that you wanted as long as your apartment wasn't too expensive or too shoddy. And instead of paying 60, 70% of your income on rent, you would pay 30% of your income, and the voucher would cover the rest. I don't know if you all have ever been with someone that's just received a housing voucher, but I have. And they act like they won the lottery because they have. They feel this <sighs> that you feel when you can root down in a community and, and stabilize your family, when you're investing where you should be investing um, in housing. It would change the face of poverty in America. It would change the housing crisis in a state like Hawaii. So let's ask two hard questions about this idea. Would that be a disincentive to work? There's plenty of research that's been thrown at that question. Some studies show that when families receive a housing voucher, they work a little less. They don't drop out of the labor market. They work a little less, probably because they can spend a little bit more time with their family now. More families, for, excuse me, more studies show that there's no relationship between re receiving some help for your housing and, and labor market participation. It's what nerds like me call a null relationship. And I think the status quo is a much bigger threat to self-sufficiency and, and work than any affordable housing program can be. Like families crushed by the high cost of housing can't afford community college classes or job training so they can get plugged into a better place in the labor market. Many can't afford to hold their job down long enough because they can't hold their house down. And think of all the brain power and like potential and beauty and intelligence that we just squander and waste. Because we asked someone like Arlene to spend so much of hers trying to figure out how she's gonna make a rent from one month to the next or where she's gonna live after she's like inevitably, predictably evicted. Poverty reduces people born for better things. Arlene didn't want some small life. She didn't want to like game the system and eke out a little existence. She wanted to work and thrive and contribute. Poverty is a complicated problem. But like providing a stable, affordable home to her family would give her a shot at her realizing her full potential. Second question. Uh, universal housing program sounds kind of expensive. Can we afford it? It's totally expensive. We can totally afford it. So a few years ago, the Bipartisan Policy Center crunched the numbers, and they suggested, they estimated, that the kind of thing I'm asking us to consider tonight would cost us as a nation additional $22 billion. I think that was an underestimate. Let's say it's $30 billion or $35 billion. $22 billion, $30 billion. Not a small figure. It's well within our capacity. We have the money. We've just made decisions about how to spend it. So every year in this country, homeowner tax subsidies, like the mortgage interest deduction, those subsidies far, far outpace direct housing assistance to the needy. We already have a universal housing program. It's an entitlement. It's just not for poor people. So the year that Arlene got evicted from 13th Street, we as a nation spent about $41 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy. Housing vouchers, public housing, everything, $41 billion. That same year, we spent about $171 billion on homeowner tax subsidies. That number, $171 billion, is equivalent to the entire budgets of the Departments of Education, Veteran Affairs, Homeland Security, Justice, and Agriculture combined. It's a rather large number. Most of that benefit went to families with six-figure incomes. Bigger income, bigger mortgage, bigger mortgage, bigger deduction. Most white Americans own their home and are eligible for one of the sweetest cutouts in the tax code. Most black and Latinx Americans do not because of our legacy of systematically 
discriminating against people of color from the land. It's hard to think of a social policy that does a better job of amplifying our racial and economic inequality than our housing policy does. So if we're gonna spend the bulk of our public dollars on the rich, at least when it comes to housing, I say we just be honest about that. I say we just don't up to that. Be like, we like it like this, actually. This is the social contract that we can sign our names to instead of repeating this lie that the richest country on the planet can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in America or in Hawaii, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. OK, so that's one idea. Um, there are plenty more. And um, you know the housing crisis can be solved in a lot of different ways. Probably should be. You know what works in Milwaukee is probably going to fail in, in Honolulu. But whatever way out of this mess, I think one thing is certain, which is like this degree of um, inequality and this cold denial of just a basic human need and this level of social suffering, this blunting of human potential. This isn't us. This doesn't have to be us. By no American value is this situation justified. There's no ethical code. There's no piece of scripture. There's no holy teaching that can be summoned to defend what we allowed our country to become. Thanks so much for y'all time and really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Matt. Is this mic on? OK, so we're going to do um, Q&A mostly from cards that many of you are passing to the students in the aisles. But we also wanted to hear from, uh, there's so many people in the audience tonight who are working really hard, creatively, diligently on addressing this crisis in Hawaii. So we wanted to just invite a couple of people up to either ask a question. Um, or make a comment. Um, so we'll do that for like three or four people, and then we'll um, have one of our grad students, Sarah Jung, um, be reading your questions that we've been collecting and reviewing during the talk. So I first wanted to invite up um, Representative Nadine Nakamura, the chair of the Housing Committee in the House of Representatives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Desmond, for your speech and for all that we learned from um, your experience talking about Arlene and talking about uh, the experience that you went through with landlords and tenants. I think we can all agree um, the Hawaii State Legislature is taking a very active role in trying to address the affordable housing problems in Hawaii. Uh, very similar problems to the, to the ones you mentioned. But as uh, Senator Chang said, uh, we have the highest rate of uh, homelessness per capita in our nation. Uh, the cost of housing is skyrocketing. Um, uh, some of the exciting things that we are proposing this session include uh, providing $600 million to the Department of Hawaiian Homeland so we can address the 28,000 people who are on the waiting list. We're proposing to put in $300 million into the Rental Housing Revolving Fund so that we can leverage low-income housing, the federal low-income housing tax credits, and build housing for the very low income. We're also looking at putting in 15 to $30 million into Ohana zones so that we can build transitional housing, assessment centers, and wraparound services for our homeless families. And we are looking at leveraging our TANF funds, temporary aid for needy families, for those with very extremely low incomes to uh, to set aside this block grant that we get. And right now, under the current program, families who qualify, these are very extremely low-income families with children, uh, they only get two months worth of 
housing allowance, rental housing allowance, according to our state rules. So our legislation is to increase it to the five years that they can stay into the program and get up to $500 a month. And uh, that's moving along in our legislature. And I think one of the non-legislative uh, program that we are also pursuing is taking advantage of the $2.86 billion that Hawaii will receive from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to um, focus on how we can use this to build infrastructure uh, for affordable housing. And so we are working very closely, working with the Hawaii Business Roundtable, working with each of the counties to identify the low-hanging affordable housing developments and the infrastructure that's needed to make that happen, and, and then try to build as many homes as we can with this infusion of federal funding. So with all of these, we're, we hope to uh, make a dent. We're going to have to continue this level of funding uh, for many years. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be part of a, a legislative team that's, that's willing to move in this direction. We know we, if we don't do it, uh, the housing problems will get even worse. So we thank you so much for the insights that you raised. Uh, we agree totally that Section 8 housing that's project-based for those with special needs especially is, is critical. And the home mortgage deduction is a subsidy that could be channeled to other uh, uses. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Matt, you should, you should feel free to jump in and say whatever you like in between. Um, but I was going to next invite up our lieutenant governor, also an emergency room doc, um, who's devoted a lot of his work in public office to what we might call, I guess, the post-eviction post sector of the housing market, Hawaii's um, incredibly high rate of houselessness. of the ending of the mask mandate tomorrow. I'm going to just not wear it today. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, thank you for being here. Um, a quick comment and then a question. So in Hawaii, when people have been evicted or have become homeless, we found that though Hawaii has the longest average lifespan in the country, for those who are doing well, it's about 80 years of life, healthiest state, uh, those who are houseless live uh, 30 years less on average in Hawaii. So essentially has become the worst disease you can get, to be housing unstable. It disproportionately, per your conversation, um, affects those who are uh, minorities, or we don't maybe describe them as minorities in Hawaii because we are a series of minority populations, but those who are Hawaiian, my wife's family, live an average of 10 years less. And I'm sure that it's coupled to what you've described. Two questions, I guess, maybe you might reflect on. One is, as I hear the excellent um, processes that are going on in the legislature and the things they're doing, and I was there with them for 14 years, I sometimes feel like the problem is so big, it's like a tidal wave even overcoming good ideas, using TANF monies or putting more money into the revolving housing trust fund. It feels like we never get ahead, we never build enough. So if you might comment on what dramatic or bold things could be done, one. And the other question I thought I might ask you is, we're going to raise, it appears, uh, the living wage. We're at $10.10, which is $21,000 a year for a person at minimum wage. And you know Hawaii, very expensive, not possible to live on those uh, amounts of money. What is the impact in a place like ours or in other great cities across our country if we really do dramatically increase wages to $15 or $18 an hour? Is there housing out there? Can that actually help us stem this tidal wave? So just some things maybe to opine on. I'll opine away. So um, we should clap. We should clap. I think there's good news and bad news about raising the, the wage, the living wage. You know, you know what happens when you raise minimum wage to living wage is like 
what do you give people? And you really literally give them life. People stop smoking as much. Child abuse rates go down. Um, people sleep longer. Uh, people work less, you know? Um, so what we're doing when we're not paying people a fair wage for their labor is we're literally stealing life from them. And I'm glad you framed this question as, as one that was centered around health and life because that's, that's where it is. So I applaud you for raising minimum wage. I think that's not only morally necessary, but just incredibly life-giving. But here's the thing that happens often in cities that raise the minimum wage is the housing market recoups your costs or your wage. And so and this has been the case for over 100 years. So like in 1830s, there was labor unrest in America. A lot of workers were going on strike, raising cane. And uh, the industrial capitalists that had the factories went to the landed capitalists and said, hey, help us put down these worker strikes. And the landlord's like, no way, because when you jack up the wage, we're going to jack up the rent. And they did. And that's been repeated over and over again in America. And you can look at these econ studies, and it shows that like, when uh, cities raise the minimum wage, the housing market uh, um, often raises as well. It doesn't recoup all of the wage, but it recoups some, which suggests that you can't, you can't like, we can't get out of this problem only by raising the floor. You know, we have to do something uh, about the ceiling and figuring out where bills are, are, are going to, where the money is flowing to. Then you asked a question about being big and being visionary. And one thing that I heard in that question, so I can answer that question a lot of different ways, right? I could say we should, we should build a lot more housing. We should expand a lot more vouchers. We, you know, I could, I, could show, I could tell you what's going on in Tacoma, Washington, where the school system teamed up with the housing system and realized that like, we're going to stabilize these classrooms and invest in these kids' education. We were talking about uh, the healthcare industry getting in, in, into it and how uh, hospitals are investing in, in housing as a community-based health uh, intervention, which it is. But the thing that you said, right, is like you kind of get these headwinds, right? You get these headwinds. And what I heard in that was about us, I think, was about us. A lot of times we're like, man, if there was only the political will. We are the political will. The political will for folks like in the state legislature and for folks on city councils, when they propose building a homeless shelter in a community or building affordable housing development, is a lot of people exercising their political will against those things. And we need other voices in the room. We need people to be like, I would love to have an affordable housing development in my community. I think that's part of what it means to be in this community. I would love my kids to go to school with those kids. I would love that. If we're not in the room raising our voice to that, I don't know how much of a claim we can make on being progressive. Um, I wanted to shift just for a moment to the kind of nonprofit community, and there's just so many people here representing a variety of nonprofits from a whole series of groups funded by Hawaii Community Foundation to like a big trust, Kamehameha Schools, that has a lot of pilot and interesting projects trying to increase affordable housing for Native Hawaiians. Um, to, there's a lot of interesting programs in Hawaii that people who've lost their homes themselves have been building their own communities in Waianae and Waimanalo and other places. But I just wanted to single out one, Terry George, he's the CEO of the Castle Foundation, might talk about some of the organizations he's working with, just to give you a a sense of some of the nonprofit work that's going on too. And then we'll turn to a couple of your, um, a few of your questions submitted by card, even though the, the clock is kind of moving relentlessly toward close. You guys aren't gonna clap for Terry? Thank you, appreciate it. Aloha everybody and thanks so much for being here. Um, just want to talk about how you made me mad and a little bit smart, and you're making me mad again, um, but maybe talk a little bit about what we've done with that anger. I run um, a private foundation on the green side of this, the windward side of this island called the Harold Castle Foundation. So I was you know, in an airport bookstore between flights, picked up a light reading, entertaining, called Evicted, started reading it, and I got so horrified, immediately stopped reading and gave it to James Koshiba and said, you gotta read this, because he is one of the smarter thinkers, uh, I think, around how to solve these challenging problems. 
Um, but anyway, we learned from grassroots community leaders that after the first six, nine months of the uh, pandemic on the windward side, when the bottom dropped out of our tourism dependent economy and food was the initial thing to look at and then healthcare, housing was on their minds next. So we built up a grassroots element to the eviction prevention work to take advantage of all the federal dollars. And we co-designed it with a bunch of people who were in the room. Um, and then we um, funded several grassroots organizations who um, then created community navigator positions for, by trusted community leaders. There are 10 of them. You won't be surprised, they're all women. They're almost all native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander and they're unbelievable. And those folks over the last year um, have actually prevented a thousand evictions on the Windward side through just relentlessly working together. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'd like to challenge all of us, you've got some big ideas um, and Hawaii has actually been a pioneer for other big ideas like affordable health care. And I'm wondering whether or not with the kind of leadership that we have right now in our legislature and the kind of unified horror of the future that we're going to face if we don't wrestle with this, whether we might want to take some of your large ideas. So my first question is, you know, would you be willing to continue um, this after you go back um, to the East Coast to really iterate this together? Because I think we could be a pioneer. The second thing to share with you to make you feel good is that we used the data from the ev uh, eviction lab. We're still using it for the work that we're doing on the Windward side. We've got a group here called the Hawaii Data Collaborative that's brought a lot of new energy into data, strategic data analysis. So they overlaid some of the data that you have by census tract. And then we overlaid over that the data that our community navigators were doing on their own little sales force uh, a program to see whether we were actually making a dent in the areas that of greatest need. And uh, that's kept us all honest, which is really helpful. Um, so we're continuing to use that. And then the final thing is that you really made me understand, and the community navigators are learning this too, is there's this vast sort of underworld that has will never be touched by the good work that's going on right now in the legislature, hopefully, about official subsidized housing. You have so many people right now on the windward side they're homeless. They're, they're choosing not to go through eviction or they're being forced not to go through it. And they're just couch surfing with friends, families, and neighbors. And they're not homeless enough to be counted. Um, and they're there and no one is counting them. The only ones who actually know anything about them are the homeless liaison officers in the public school system. And we're doing nothing for them right now. And so I'm curious to know what, what, where we can learn um, what other places can we learn from? You mentioned Tacoma as one great example. What are other places that we can really learn from and be emboldened? And also, finally, are you willing to continue to work with Hawaii in some way? I Thank would. You. I think it's a work that has to take place in person, though. It feels like that's the, the, only, <laughs> the only way we can really get it. Thank you. Um, I love what y'all are doing here. You know, I would be honored to continue the conversation. I think that there's things that we can do that are that are big and, and visionary. You know, could, could Hawaii be the leader of the country when it comes to establishing the fundamental need for housing for every single citizen of Hawaii? You know, could you uh, lead the nation on that? I, I sure hope so. There are things that we can do that are, um, that look, they're costly and they, they should be investments. And there are things that we can do that are absolutely free. For example, um, in Rochester, New York, if you want to evict someone, you have to use your real name, the name on your driver's license. Interesting. It's just Rochester's like, we're going to keep a tab on who's doing all the evicting in this, in this city. I think that's interesting. You can seal eviction records so that eviction records can't be used to harm people's housing searches or their credit. Now, if eviction court was a fair court like you see in the movies or something, and there's lawyers on both sides, and, you know, but that's not how it is. You know? There's no right to an attorney in civil court. So most folks you know, who are getting evicted don't show up. I wouldn't show up if I had to face off with my landlord's attorney. You know, so I think that you can think about sealing cases. You can think about investing in providing legal counsel to families in eviction court. So there are a lot of things that are going around in the country. So when New York, for example, established the right to an attorney in eviction court, they reduced eviction filings in the city by 40% over three years. Huge intervention, providing folks with a lawyer by their side. If any of us would, are getting evicted and we could afford it, we'd hire a lawyer. 
You know, we know it's the right thing to do. So I think investing in, uh, in a right to attorney uh, matters. Um, there are cities that are small and have a lot less resources than Honolulu does that are doing amazing things. Like I was in, um, I was in Wichita, Kansas, where a bunch of Catholic nuns just got fed up by the housing crisis, and they pushed for an extra sales tax, and all the, the money went into building affordable housing. Seattle has a, has a housing tax, has a housing levy, that they've passed for 30, the last 30 years, because and they, they sell it, be like, we're not gonna become like San Francisco. You guys know there are more dogs than kids in San Francisco right now? More dogs than kids. It's becoming unlivable to families. And so Seattle's like, we're not gonna be like that. They passed the housing levy, last time they did it, they raised, um, they raised, uh, what was it, $200 million over seven years, they passed 70% of the vote. So I think we can raise our own revenue and invest in affordable housing too. So there's tons of things going on around, all around the country. We don't have to look very far to see programs that are working. We just need to dose the problem bigger. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Desmond, for your amazing talk tonight. Um, thank you also to our three commenters um, who have gone a little before. Um, and many thanks to everyone in the audience who has also sent in their questions um, to the front. We really appreciate it. Due to time constraints, we unfortunately won't get to every single one of them, but we will try our best. Um, so the first question I have for you is this. Um, we cannot solely build our way out of this problem. What regulatory solutions to, do you recommend for a community like ours? So we need more housing. We do need to build. But building means investing in the, the problem in the, in the future, too, right? We need interventions now for kids now, and we need interventions for families later. So I think building is a huge part of the solution. But there are other things you could do right now. So we talked about regulatory solutions. So you can make evictions harder. You can make it more costly. Uh, that really helps. You can think about um, making housing court more humane. So Hawaii used to have a mediation in housing court. I don't know if that's still the case, but if it is, that's amazing. So it's, it's very simple. It's like, if you want to evict someone, you got to go through mediation first. Think of it as like drug court for housing. Philadelphia has a mandatory mediation session right now. It's drastically reducing evictions in the city. Like evictions are often thought of as like, okay, someone's like seven, eight months behind in rent. <sighs> what else can I do? I got to evict them. That's like 2% of evictions in the country, more than six months behind in rent. You know, most evictions are for two months in rent, but a third of evictions in the country are for less than a month's worth of rent. Like in Virginia, for example, one in 10 evictions are for less than $350. And so there are interventions we can make in this problem that are just so cost efficient that we can intervene upstream so we don't have to deal with the problem downstream, and it's just more humane. Thank you. The next question is this. Uh, what do you do when no landlords would take vouchers? We have dozens of individuals who get the vouchers, but no landlord would take it. Right. So the voucher needs to be more responsive to your hot housing market. So many landlords aren't taking the vouchers because they don't have to, right? They're making a good return anyways without your intervention. We could make our vouchers more responsive to it. So this is a little nerdy, but follow me. So like... HUD sets the limit for housing vouchers, a cap, at um, something that's called a fair market area, okay? In New York City, for example, the fair market area includes the Upper West Side and Queens, okay? It includes the most posh area of the city and the poorest area of the city. That means that the vouchers are not going to work on the Upper West Side and they overwork in Queens, okay? Like, let me, let me break it down for you. So like, if I have a voucher and Sarah does not, and we're neighbors, most people that have a voucher end up in low-income neighborhoods. So a landlord can charge me more than charging Sarah, and they do. And so like in Milwaukee, if I had a voucher, I'd be paying $50 more a month than Sarah would. I wouldn't be paying it, taxpayer would be paying it. Our vouchers don't have to be so blunt. Like we can make it much more uh, market efficient. We can also make it illegal for landlords to turn away someone because they have a voucher, period. So this is called source of income discrimination. And we can say, look, you can't discriminate if you're racist, you can't discriminate against kids, and you can't discriminate just because someone's paying the rent through a voucher, period. 
Now, if we just use the stick, though, I don't think it's going to be entirely successful. I think a lot of property owners are going to say, well, I'll, I'll sell it, or I'll convert my building into a condo and sell it on the market. So we also want to make sure we understand why property owners are saying no to voucher holders. And some of the reason is because they find the process onerous. They find the housing inspection onerous. And I think we can meet property owners in the middle about that and kind of make sure that we can say, look, we're not going to allow you to discriminate on income, but we're going to make this process a lot easier than it has been for you. Although this passionate analysis is incredibly important, did you feel an urge to directly help the families you studied? And did the evicted families also receive any kind of material or financial benefit from being in your studies? I did feel the urge, and I did help. So I think that you know there are times where I felt like the moral imperative just like superseded the scientific imperative. So there was one time where Vanetta had been at a homeless shelter uh, and just looking for housing, looking for housing. Finally, she gets housing. In Milwaukee, at the bottom of the market, when you rent housing, often your apartment doesn't come with a fridge or a or stove. You just like move into this like apartment with nothing. And she got into an altercation with a neighbor, and the neighbor called Child Protective Services on Vanetta. And so she called me just terrified because, you know, you don't have a fridge, right? You're living with young kids, you don't have a fridge. And so she asked to borrow money to go buy a fridge and a stove. So I did that. Um, in the story I told you tonight, like I was the guy that rented Arlene the, the U-Haul truck. I think that in the university, there's this idea, this old idea that like you need distance to understand a problem. And I think there's plenty of distance in the university. Um, I think that distance is the problem. I think you can fall in love with people and still tell their story honestly. And so yes, the, the folks in Evicted uh, did receive financial contri uh, uh, contrib uh, what, contributions, I don't, I don't remember. It's like, it's like 2 a.m. where I'm from, OK? So, um, and so my wife and I started a foundation called the Evicted Book Foundation, where we shared proceeds with the folks that are, are in the book. They weren't promised any uh, proceeds when I started the research. They told their story well, willingly and without coercion. I had no idea if anyone would buy the book or read it. And, uh, but we've been able to send some kids to college and pay off medical debt and stabilize people's housing and things like that. How do you address the, the problem of eviction in a state like Hawaii, where the rate of homelessness is closely tied to the history of this position and um, the eviction of Kanaka Maoli um, for the native Hawaiian population? I feel like I'm over my skis on that question. Skis are things that people wear. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, 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 I don't, I feel like, I feel like there's so much about Hawaii that I need to learn and understand to really nail that question. But I don't feel it's too controversial to be like, Hawaii's not unique in dispossessing people of color from the land, and, which means that part of our response to this, this problem has to be a reconciliation with justice and not just a policy fix. And so the reason that most white Americans are homeowners is because the federal government, after World War II, made that, you know, so. So after World War II, we had the GI Bill. It was 16% of the federal budget. OK, nothing is 16% of the federal budget. 16% of the federal budget is like nothing we've ever seen before or since. The GI Bill was huge. Almost one in two mortgages after World War II were veteran mortgages. But black and Latinx and other people of color who were veterans who served were barred. You know, their neighborhoods were redlined, the banks wouldn't loan to them, and so they were cut out and left out of this deal. So I think that, and I, you know, and I know that Hawaii has similar uh, stories, and so I think that when we're thinking about this, we have to think about this in terms of, of righting and restoring historical wrongs, or else we're never going to get out of the problem. Um, because at the time is now um, 8.05, I will ask this last question. Uh, what COVID relief programs have been most successful, and what should we keep? We should keep all of it. <laughs> we should keep all of it. So, OK, so, so I, was, uh, I was ranting about this last night, so I forg forgive my, my partners who heard my rant last night on this. OK, so, so we have an eviction moratorium, right? It saves lives. It saves lives. But here's the deal. Eviction harms people all the time. So like, we have a study that shows if, if you're pregnant and you get evicted, 
your babies are born with much bigger health problems. They're born with lower weight. They're born prematurely. This is an eerie finding because, as the doctors in the room know, if you're born with lower weight, lower, more health problems, that can be generational. That can affect your health for your life, and it can affect your baby's health later on. Which means like an eviction is having these generational health effects all the time. And so thinking about making eviction harder, making it a, a, a solution of last resort, should be something that's on the table for us. Or thinking about the emergency rental assistance. Emergency rental assistance was incredible. Incredible, this incredible flex for the federal government that basically took the eviction rate and cut it in half. I think we could have made that problem, you know, that project permanent and should. And it's it's unconsciousable to me that we're even considering getting rid of the child tax credit. Like we cut child poverty by over a third last year. Over a third. We should be out like banging pots and pans like we did for like health care workers at the beginning of the pandemic. We cut child poverty by over a third, and that's just going to go away. And so I think that like showing the intervention of the federal government in the least is like this strong argument against this idea that like the government can't address or solve poverty. It kind of just did. So, um, so I think we can do it. One just final wrap up on this big question. I was crunching the numbers the other day because I asked, like, how much would it take just to solve poverty in America? Like, how much would that take? So um, it would take about uh, $177 billion every year. And you get that number by you calculate everyone below the poverty line, and you calculate the gap between where they are and what poverty would be. I'm not saying $177 billion would make life perfect in America, but that would basically end poverty every year, that intervention. Rough estimate, super rough. That's like, uh, that's less than 1% of our GDP. You know, that's like if instead of writing off all our employer tax benefits for our health insurance that we receive from our jobs, we just wrote off half, that would pay for it. So I think there are things that seem like totally out of reach, which when you really dig into it and look at it are, are totally within our grasp. Um, Thanks for those questions. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. <laughs>